Okay. Can people hear me? I was told I need to project quite a bit. Is that better? Higher, I can talk more? Oh, sweet. I'm a yeller, so this is going to be great. Uh, I have 54 slides and eight t-shirts, so uh, let's go. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Kerry Miller. Um, I work for a startup in San Francisco called GritHub. Uh, we turn plus one comments into annoyances for committers. Um, now, I, I do work at GitHub. I'm a level five application engineer, uh, which means I now can cast unlimited private repos three times per day, and I have shell access. Uh, this is my dog. Um, I guess if Tenderlove gets to put his dog uh, or his cats in things, I can have my dog. Uh, my dog is actually a licensed jurisprudence doctor. Um, he can answer all of your legal questions. His fees are quite reasonable. Um, if you were here last year, um, I gave a talk about Shakespeare um, and Postgres. Um, does anyone, was anyone here last year? Did anyone actually see me talk last year? And you're still in the room. Awesome. <coughs> That's great. Um, I'm not going to do any Shakespeare this year, but I did want to share like, some of my favorite Shakespearean uh, insults with you. Uh, is that OK? Yes. <laughs> OK. <clears throat> I will bite my thumb at them, which is a disgrace to them, if they bear it, which is Shakespeare's way of saying, Come at me, bro. <laughs> Thou art a boil, a plague sore, an embossed carbuncle in my corrupted blood, which is Shakespearean for, yo, step off, you blood-sucking leech. <laughs> you scallion, you rampalian, you fustilarian, I'll tickle your catastrophe, which is basically Shakespeare saying, you suck, everyone knows you suck, and I'm going to laugh at you when it comes all crashing down. Uh, and of course, uh, one of my favorites uh, from Titus Andronicus um, mom jokes are timeless. Um, I'm, a, I'm a moon bat. I went to Goddard College in uh, Plainfield, Vermont, um, where I took such uh, I have credits in classes such as Star Trek and the Existential Dilemma. Um, I have nine credits in dishwashing, literally nine credits. Um, and. Um, Goddard is an experiential college. We do a lot of like design your own majors, if you can't tell, um, including uh, such explorations as the meaning of the joke. Because uh, in, in the little town, the little college town that my college is in, there's a joke. Uh, why did the Goddard student cross the road? Why? To get credit. <laughs> Uh, no, when you get to design your own, your own uh, classes, you get to uh, basically you find like a local expert in the community or nowadays online um, to kind of mentor and guide you in this area of research. Uh, and you get to pick out like your own reading list, um, which leads to some really interesting bibliographies at times. Uh, for a brief time, um, I, I was a performance production major. Um, I wasn't actually a computer scientist. But for a brief period of time, I was a historian. And that, and that sort of interest in history still lingers to this day. Uh, in fact, um, I did a, quite a bit of study into um, American history. And I'm following that up now with a life project of reading biographies about all the American presidents and the founding fathers. Uh, which is really, really super interesting. So if you ever uh, get stuck in one of those trivia game shows and you need to know about Martin Van Buren, Call me. Call me. I'm your dial a friend. Um, you want to hear some Martin Van Buren trivia? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting story. Uh, Martin Van Buren from New York, uh, only American president whose uh, first language was not English. Uh, he was born to Dutch parents. Uh, he spoke Dutch until the age of 14. Um, he's also the first president who was born within the United States. Every other president up to Martin Van Buren was born as a British citizen. Yeah, right? Um, our founding fathers are a really interesting bunch. Um, you find out a lot of things about them over time uh, that kind of you know, burst your bubble about thinking of what great men they are. Um, yeah, kind of a crap general. Uh, he lost every, almost every single major pitched battle he fought against the British uh, because of his crappy technique. Um, he thought, wow, these American revolutionaries can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Brit the best the British Army can hire. Not so. Um, yes, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Um, not quite. Uh, he actually held under bondage his own children with Sally Hemings until his death when he um, uh, emancipated them. Um, my favorite, though, is Ben Franklin. If you ever read his autobiography, you find out 
wow, he loved the ladies, and ladies loved him. Uh, this is actually the cover art of his, bio his autobiography, if you go pick it up in a store. He was well loved in the salons of France, and uh, other founding fathers criticized his lascivious and lecherous ways. Uh, which is funny, if you, if you Google for uh, Ben Franklin, you get a lot of images like this, so it pertains even today with the cosplay. But, you know, these funny fathers had a lot of, like, really great, amazing ideas, you know, and, and they're, like, lots of inspirational quotes. For example, they all kind of come down to us like this. Um, I, I think, like, anything that, that anybody ever says that's put over, like, a piece of beautiful uh, nature photography is, like, kind of automatically like, this awesome thing. Um, so I gave it a try. <laughs> um, you, can, you can retweet that, hashtag it, whatever you want. Um, it'll be at a poster store at the mall near you. This is a really common one that I, I see a lot, though, when you're at that store in the mall. What is it, like Notions? or What's the name of that store that sells all the posters in a mall? I haven't been in a mall in like forever because I'm a dirty hippie. <laughs> Unfortunately, I mean, you can't always trust um, you know, the things that people say, especially smart people. Um, because a lot of times, uh, you know, we, we assign uh, wisdom to people that we think are, are greater than ourselves. And we especially assign wisdom to things that we don't quite understand. And the, the truth of it is that people often disguise their discomfort with a concept by using big words or confusing language. Um, and I very firmly believe that, uh, especially in technology, you know, a person's understanding of the problem is in inverse proportion to the size of the words they have to use to explain it most of the time. Um, in technology, there's a whole bunch of words that uh, people use that I don't think they quite understand what they mean. Um, item potent is my favorite. Like, comes up like three, three times a thread on just about every like, computing argument I ever hear, and uh, people can't really define it. Um, the one that uh, I want to talk about today, though, um, that I'm a, I'm a huge fan of is actually uh, SOLID principles. SOLID is an acronym. Uh, if you can't guess, it stands for these five Principles. These are the first five principles from a series of papers uh, written on object-oriented programming or, that have been collected over the years. Um, that sort of set out sort of a manifesto or a guideline. And what I love about these is that um, each one builds on, on the one that came before it, and it's sort of a, a rough guideline or suggestion about how you want to structure objects, the relationship between objects, and how they exist within your system. Um, these ideas are a roadmap, they're a guide, uh, philosophy to follow uh, when you don't know what else to do. Because, um, like, everybody, want, we all want our software to kind of act like this, you know? Like, everything has its own little individual life, but it just kind of works all together. Let's all get Vertigo together. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, object oriented principles, I think it's really important to kind of like talk about. Um, what are objects to begin with? Like, what, what, are, what are objects? What do objects mean to you all? First person to answer gets a t-shirt. <laughs> Sam. Uh, packages of state and code. Packages of state and code. That's pretty good, because you are clearly an expert. <laughs> Sam, what size are you? I can buy this audience. <laughs> Anyone want a medium? <laughs> Sorry, I just like closed my eyes on that one. <laughs> um, again, but you don't have to be an expert. Like, you don't have to have a computer science degree to, to kind of look at objects and their relationships and these, some of these concepts. Unfortunately, like, a lot of these papers are really dense, and it really helps if you have that kind of background. Um, I've admitted that I'm not, I'm not a computer scientist. Uh, anyone here a computer scientist? Or is that your degree work? Like three people. OK, that's fine. Oh, well, there's a fourth here. You want the tank top? OK, there's a tank top in here. Um, yeah, so classically, objects are a representation of a thing. We think of this like, as like the verb. It, it doesn't do anything. It just sort of sits there. And the methods that exist on that object are the, the the verbs, these are the things that it can do. And then the properties, the variables, it's sort of like the description of the thing, it's adjectives, what state is it in right now? And this is how I would explain it to uh, you know, my beginning programming classes. 
Um, some people have the modern approach, uh, which is talking about behavior, uh, but we'll skip right past that because I've got a whole ton more slides. Um, an object, as Sam said, is a collection of behaviors and the state of them. Um, so let's just jump right through here because I don't have a fun slide. Uh, single responsibility principle. Class should have one and only one reason to change, meaning that a class should have only one job. This is the first of the five, and this is the one that most Ruby developers kind of know. If not instinctually, it's the one we hear about all the dang time. Um, basically, your code shouldn't try to pat its head and rub its belly. Right? That's the, is that the motion? Chewing gum and walking. Um, you can do it, sure, but you're, it's not always that easy. You're not going to do either thing terribly well. Uh, it makes it really hard to test. We kind of want our software to like not fall over all the time. It's so, like one thing going wrong, knocking everything else over. And that can happen if you start leeching responsibilities across objects. So very often you'll see this in active record objects, which are a horrible mess to begin with. They access data, they also define data. And then you know, typically in a Rails application, we're putting class methods and instance methods into the same thing. We're mixing all different types of way of thinking about a user object. Um, this leads to like, you know, like playing Jenga and trying to do speed dating at the same time. It's just kind of a mess. So for the sake of discussion, uh, and so that I can claim that this is actually a technical talk, I put some code in here. Um, if we were going to write up an app to help me run my kickball team, I might start with players. Uh, players uh, can define their stats. It's pretty simple. It's a question I would ask of them. Uh, and then we have some teams where we can like, look at the players and figure out, like, well, how good is this team at kicking? In Pooter, uh, Sandy Matt suggests like, describing out loud what an object does and seeing like, how many times you have to word, use the word and or the word or. In each one of those clauses that are, are connected by those conduct conductors, um, it's going to be that's another responsibility this class has to do. Uh, and the more of those that you, you stack up, the more responsibilities you're mixing together. So what is team doing? I mean, we could think that, well, the team is holding the state of all the players. It knows who its players are which is, you know, that's probably an okay, okay responsibility. It might not even rise to the level of a single responsibility. Uh, and then it can, like, figure out the average. But what it can also do is it actually also formats the average when it does the output on the HTML. So a really quick sort of uh, single responsibility refactoring that you often see is taking out something like the formatting of the output. So you can ask an object, what are your properties? What values do you have? But it has no control or knowledge about how that's going to be used. This object assumes that it's going to be working within web space or something that understands HTML. Whew. Open close principle. Objects and entities should be open for extension but closed for modification. Simple, right? This is you don't have to, you don't have to do brain surgery just to put on a hat. Um, you should be able to add features or methods to a class without having to change other existing methods or code that exists within that class. So if we were dealing with players again, um, you know, now we're going to define their kicking order because that's really important. And so we say, well, if your position is first base, you go first, and second base, you go second, and so on and so on until you get to, I guess, ninth base. I don't know. Is anyone here like major in kickball? I majored in ultimate because it was a hippie school. Okay. So basically, like, like what, if you want, what if you want the bench rider kid or the scorekeeper like me to like, come kick on your, your, your kickball team? Like, what, does it, what would have to happen there? Well, you'd have to go in here and, and continue expanding this little piece of code. Um, this is a violation of the open-close principle because we have to modify existing code to account for new behavior or new uh, relationship within the system. So one way to get around this is to actually define the kicking order on the players themselves. And you can go a step further and use, if you're going to be an assistant that's using inheritance and having those be passed down to each sort of class of player. So for example, a first base person in the generic sense goes first. Our system just assumes that that happens. And again, this is ideal. This is, this is, um, this is sort of like a, a canned code exercise example. But you can sort of see this if you looked at, say, you're writing a billing system and you want to accept payments. And now you have all of this special casing. Well, is it credit card payment? Is it Visa? Is it Amex? Was it, was it some weird chip and pin 
uh, point of sale that we're dealing with and having all this sort of special casing flagging around instead of devolving those responsibilities outwards into, uh, say, different classes or objects. Liskov substitution. Anyone understand this one? Very, very good friend of mine. Uh, she actually teaches graduate level math at Cambridge, which is kind of a weird humble brag when you think about it. Um, but um, I read her this, this uh, description and was like, you understand this, right? Like, it makes sense to you. And she was, yes, yes, of course. This is, this is what I do all day long. She has category theory and topology. Uh, Liskov often sort of gets explained down um, that subtypes must be substitutable for their base types. So anytime you're, you're dealing with uh, subclasses, um, a subclass should work in any situation that you would use the parent. And it should be relatively seamless, because this is about the relationship of the person who's interacting with the, the class itself. So to go back to the, um, the playground idea, if we we're going to play Frisbee, and I throw you a Frisbee, um, that works pretty well, right? I can also throw you an Aerobee. Do you, know, you folks know what an Aerobee is? I don't believe this. I guess I really am in this weird strata of like Frisbee knowledge. Um, a, an Aerobee is a, a, a single ring. So think of like a uh, Frisbee with the whole middle punched out, like a Frisbee donut. Um, they're pretty amazing. Uh, unfortunately, um, and they're, they're interchangeable within the context of playing a game of catch. Um, they're not interchangeable within the context of eating a piece of pie. They are not interchangeable for what can go over your head. Um, so Liskov tells us that as long as our relationship to it um, is limited to this one concept, this one idea of how am I interacting with this object, I should be able to swap in these different subtypes. Because the Frisbee and this Aerobee are flying disks or something like that. So in the kickball idea, what if we add a third base person class here? Liskov, in a way, is an argument for the consistency between our subclasses. We're looking at a different subclass from the perspective of the client who's actually interacting with it. So if a teacher's organizing the game and asking players for their positions, um, that's great if everybody returns it as a string. But now the third base person is returning it as a hash. Great. Thanks, third base person. This would be a violation of Liskov. It should be at least be consistent so that we don't have to do special casing around these different subtypes, because our parent, the code that is inter interacting with these different subclasses should be able to make assumptions about how they're working. Interface segregation. Uh, this is one of the principles that you'll get different explanations about, depending on who you ask. Um, Java developers have an opinion about interface segregation. I think it's called factories. Yeah, one person's used factories. Uh, Ruby devs, uh, we tend to kind of ignore this quite a bit because of flexibility through duct typing. And the dynamic nature of our language really erases a number of the violations that we tend to see around interface segregation. But it's often expressed as each object knowing as little as possible about the other objects they're interacting with. Um, and when I've, gotten, when I've explained this to students, um, it's really along the lines of, um, let's say that you and I, sir, go to lunch, right? And the bill comes. Do I say, hey, sorry, what's your name? Nate. Hey, Nate, could you pay the bill? That would be respecting, that would be interface segregation, respecting the interface that we have for how we pay the bill. Not respecting it is clubbing you on the head, reaching across into your wallet, pulling out your credit card, and faking your name. <laughs> Unfortunately, we do that all the time. And we talk about it like how many dots are you using and how many classes are you skipping over. And you'll see this, uh, especially in, in a lot of like long-standing Rails applications that don't follow this, um, the idea of like user.billing.address.country to figure out what country a user's in, instead of being able to just say user.country. You know, it's when you're leaping across these boundaries and reaching over into somebody else and messing around with what's inside to take it out. In the case of the kickball team, um, <laughs> this is kind of the ugly sort of thing that we might see if we were trying to calculate their salaries. Um, you know, we're also kind of violating open closed here as well. If the player is this, we do a special case, and we actually reach into their salary. Um, if you happen to be a player named Carrie, you like tuna fish sandwiches with potato chips on it. 
Um, did you ever do that when you were a kid? Oh, it's the best. It's the best until you have braces and that shard of goes up. Oh, it's the worst. It's the worst. But you know what? You live, you live dangerously, folks. <laughs> Play hard. Uh, and then finally, of course, you know, here we're like, we're we're checking the salaries themselves to see like, well, what's actually available at the cafeteria? Because if you can't get tuna fish that day at the cafeteria while well, Carrie's not getting paid, why do you get paid on kickball team? This is a ridiculous example. But like, you know, what if you get, what if you get a fourth grader that got held back a couple years and they're just a little bit bigger than everybody and you have to get half their sandwiches? Um, so it just kind of leads to this mess. But if we take away from the team class the intimate knowledge of the specific salaries that these kids want to get paid, um, you'll see something like this emerge, a sort of idea of like, team shouldn't know anything about all the different salaries, but it should be able to ask and inquire of these other classes, well, what exactly do you need? Like, what's your, what's your deal? Dependency inversion, also called dependency injection, with slight differences between the two, um, but they're pretty much interchangeable concepts. You know, that high-level modules must not depend on a low-level module. They should depend on abstractions, not concretions. This is the kind of thing that leads to, to coupling between classes. So if we have, uh, we have our team, uh, and we, we realized before that the team was uh, in control of printing, you know, or the actual output. So now what we just do is we have a roster printer class that we're able to pass uh, the name of all of our players to, and it prints them out. Easy peasy. We've separated the, co the concerns of printing out of the team, so we're, we're passing single responsibility principle. Um, but now we've created this situation now where we've bound the roster printer class to the team, right? Like, if we break roster printer, we're going to see errors in teams tests. Why? That has nothing to do with the roster printer. These things are dependent upon each other. They're bound together. They're coupled. The way that we can break that uh, is this idea of the dependency injection. And what we're doing instead is we're, we're letting it be a definable attribute on, on these method calls or in these classes. So in this case, now instead of like when we call print roster, instead of actually invoking directly the roster printer class, we just define it as an abstraction that we can call. And this lets us do things like, instead of we have roster printer, which prints just the roster as plain text, we could have an HTML printer that does basically the same thing, but now can wrap it in HTML for perhaps a web page. We could make an XML printer class if we hated ourselves completely. <laughs> this sort of like introduces this idea of thinking about things uh, in abstractions rather than these concrete specific objects. Uh, and we actually end up doing this quite a bit. Uh, anytime you've used a Rails application and you've accessed a database, you are using this exact thing. We don't go out and like specifically call the Postgres controller. We are calling the DB connection because that is hidden behind this abstraction that we don't have to think about. So that is a super fast, super high level 101 flash through solid principles. And I think that like solid is a really interesting model. And thank God it's called solid, right? Because it, like, it, it says to us, if you use these ideas, if you take these principles and apply them to the code that you're writing, your code is going to be rock solid, right? Acronyms are really, really important. <laughs> Did anyone see this in the news recently? Yeah, uh, <laughs> they had to change the name of uh, the Anton Scalia School of Law. A little unfortunate. But imagine if solid was not. What if it was like Doyle's? Like, you know, we wouldn't give it any attention. But because it's called solid, it does imply a certain amount of uh, you know, goodness there. And the interesting thing to me about solid itself is um, not that like humans came up with it, but that it seems so self-evident once you start picking into it. Each one of these principles plays on the one before it, and you get the most out of them by looking at all five concepts sort of at once, uh, rather than taking one, each one in isolation. Taken together, they support each other by interlocking, and the Venn diagram of the overlap between each concept kind of plays into the next. They describe a progression of um, 
higher level relationships. Like what does this class do all the way to how is this class interacting with other classes within the system? Solid, uh, in a lot of ways, is designed to help us be more agile in our code. They're, they allow, when you write solid code, at first it seems like, oh, I'm doing all of this extra work. I'm making subclasses, and I'm a Rubyist, and I don't like subclasses. I don't like inheritance. I don't like these abstractions and dependency injection. What that, when you actually apply it, though, what it lets us be is more flexible. It lets our code be more resilient to, in the face of change, less brittle. Um, and that makes less work overall. And I don't think I emphasized it enough earlier, but that um, when I make use of solid or any other set of design principles, um, they're a metric rather than a set of constrictive rules. It isn't that you have to um, set out to design a system uh, that makes you feel claustrophobic or to you know, put on a straitjacket that, that hinders your ability to be expressive or to be fast in your code. Sometimes, yes, you're trading a little bit of time now, just the tiniest bit of time now, to think about the relationship between your objects and how they're going to be versus the idea of, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in my code. I don't know if I'm going to need to print a team roster in JSON for some weird API later on. But if I separate out the roster printer now, for example, uh, I'll make my life easier later on. And sometimes you've got to break these rules by accident just because you don't know. You don't know where your code's going to be next time. And that's OK. Because when you understand what the design pattern is for how you write the code that lets these patterns emerge, you can see it later on when you come back to the code because all of a sudden, like, oh, I see what it needs to be and how to get there because you understand what the refactoring steps are going to be. So don't feel guilty if you break the hallowed rules of object-oriented programming. Um, there's six more beyond these first five that nobody talks about. Nobody but nobody talks about it. Slava Zizek said that um, for us to uh, imagine ideology as a kind of filter, a frame so that if you look at the same ordinary reality through that frame, everything changes. But in what sense? It's not that the frame has actually added anything. It's just that the frame opens the abyss of suspicion. And I have been thinking a lot about this in terms of software and how the ideology that we bring to software is insufficient for the job at hand. We apply our concepts, our philosophy, our ideology uh, to the next task or project or technology. And we can change those ideas uh, in and out like glasses. We can say, today, I'm going to focus on making sure everything has a single responsibility. Today, I'm going to focus on not breaking the law of Demeter. Today, I'm going to focus only on one thing and one thing only. Benjamin Franklin had these 13 rules for how to be a great person and to live a good life. And they were things like, be humble, be dedicated, go to bed early, do not drink to stupefaction, which is a wonderful word. And every week, he would rotate to the next one on his list. And he would spend that whole week working on being humble, or working on being thrifty, working on being a better person. So four times a year, he would have cycled through this whole list. And at the end of his year, he would look back and say, I'm doing pretty good, doing pretty good, except I'm supposed to be humble this week. <laughs> Thank you. In a similar way, we can cycle through different engineering concepts or, or guidelines that we bring in. We can pick, pick a particular metric tool, like complexity, and apply that to your code. But only do it for a week. Don't think that this is now the new way you have to do it. Look at repetition in your code. Look at how much are things changing? How can I devolve this? Put on a different hat for just a little while to see life and your code from a slightly different perspective. How would DHH write this code, right? How would Sam write this code? How would Steve Klabnik write this code? How am I going to write this code? And that's my challenge to you. Thank you.